In this lecture, we will be discussing about the DNA structure and its function. So the slides in this lecture is obtained from Biology, the Unity and Diversity of Life, 15th edition by Starr, Taggart, Evers, and Starr. Now, regarding the DNA, let's have a brief look at the history of how the DNA was discovered. In 1869, we have Johann Meischer. Uh, he, um, he purified a sample of anucleic acid and uh, or rather uh, uh, the, he purified a biomolecule from the nucleus of, an, of a cell and he found it, he found, uh, he actually discovered your deoxyribonucleic acid. At that time, they do not yet know what it does, just that, oh, it's present inside the nucleus of the cell. It wasn't until the early 1900s, it was Griffith, Frederick Griffith, who was doing uh, experiments on um, streptococcus pneumoniae. He was trying to find a vaccine on streptococcus pneumoniae at that time. He wa uh, his experiment, he inadvertently transferred, had, uh, he, it was, um, he found, although it's not actually, um, it's more of an accidental uh, chance, but uh, this experiment, his series of experiments led to the um, Dem he demonstrated that uh, hereditary material can be transferred from dead cells to live cells. We have your, um, basically you have your mice injected with live cells. Actually, the next slide, you have your, what he did in the experiment. So, in his experiment, first we have, he was using two strains of your Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, bacteria. So, we have the R strain and the S strain. The R strain is the um, the benign strain, so it doesn't kill. So when you inject the R strain into a mice, uh, the R strain doesn't um, doesn't kill the mice. But the S strain is the malignant one. The S strain kills the mice when injected to it, so it develops a fatal pneumonia. Now, um, when he injected uh, the uh, the S strain to uh, to the mice, uh, and the mice uh, died because of pneumonia, the the blood of the dead mice contains your uh, contains the live S cell. So basically, um, uh, during autopsies, so you find uh, live S cells in the dead, in the blood of the dead mice. Now, in the, in the third set, he had heat killed um, S strain injected to a mice, and um, the mice lived, of course, because the, the the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae was already dead at that time, so it doesn't really do any harm. However, when he mixed the, the heat-killed S-strain with, um, with a live R-strain, so remember, the S-strain is the malignant one, so the S-strain kills, uh, kills the mice, while the R-strain is the benign, it doesn't really harm or it doesn't, um, kills. It doesn't kill the uh, mice. But when he mixed the dead malignant S-strain with the live benign R-strain, and then the, the mixture of those two uh, bacteria, one dead, the, the, the dead bacteria strain and the, the live bacterial strain, he injected the mixture into, your, um, into a mice, the mice died. And when he looked at the blood of the mice, when he autopsied the mice, he found live S cells. So somehow, your ben benign R strain becomes a malignant S strain. Um, basically, this is the transformation experiment. So, what exactly happens here? So, at that time, something must have uh, something in the heat killed uh, R strain, uh, heat killed S strain must have transferred to the live R strain that caused the R strain to change. So, basically, that's the conclusion of the experiment. And um, there was a dispute there whether is it a lipid, is it a protein, or is it a nucleic acid. So, um, in 1940s, we have Avery and McCarthy. Basically, it's Oswald Avery and, Ma uh, and McLean McCarthy. Uh, they separated uh, the deadly S cells into lipids, proteins, and nucleic acid components because they want to isolate what exactly is that transforming, mat uh, transforming principle or what's the transforming agent that transformed the, the benign R strain into its, uh, to the malignant S strain. So when lipids, proteins, and RNA were destroyed, the remaining, uh, the remaining substance, which is the DNA, still transformed our cells to the S-strain. So basically, the conclusion of their experiment uh, stated that the DNA is the transforming principle. It's actually the DNA that caused the transformation. But still, by the, by the time, there's still not that um, 
conclusive or some people are still disputing it. So, again, ar- around the same time, we have um, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. They experimented this time with bacteriophages because um, in the conclusion of the uh, Avery, uh, Avery and um, McCarthy's experiment, the lipids were, were ruled out and it's actually just the final contenders, the proteins and the, um, the DNA because... Um, Basically, uh, the transforming principle must contain uh, the. Uh, it was generally um, believed that at that time that the transforming principle must have information. It must be um, a means of. Um, it must have. It should contain information because it can transform the S to uh, the R to the S train. So it contains uh, biological information. And among all of the biomolecules, at that time that was discovered. It was either the actually it's the proteins that are the most um, looked at as as uh, as a lot uh, as having a lot of information because remember uh, a protein has its um, has its sequence its uh, amino acid sequence and we have twenty amino acid sequences so it's actually a lot of information for a single polypeptide chain so basically the 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 mere fact that proteins carry a wealth of information in its um, in its structure automatically um gives people uh makes people think that oh probably it could uh probably it's protein not really the dna because at that time remember the dna they still do not know exactly what the function of the dna is now in the hershey and chase experiment they tried to experiment with um bacteriophages this time so bacteriophages are viruses that can that infects bacteria so we have the the Phages as viruses, they contain um, proteins and predominantly contain protein and your uh, nucleic acids. So, in this case, uh, in order to definitively uh, determine what is the transforming principle, they labeled it with uh, radio- radioactive isotopes. So, sulfur, the radioactive sulfur isotope is um, is used to label the proteins and we have the radioactive phosphorus for the nucleic acid. Why? Because um, proteins contain sulfur and I mean, nucleic acids do not contain sulfur. Remember, the sulfur from the proteins came from the two amino acids that have sulfur. We have methionine and cysteine. Now, for, the, the, for DNA, as a nucleic acid, it contains phos- a lot of phosphate groups. So, basically, they use uh, radio-labeled phosphates. And phosphates cannot be found in, um, in proteins. Basically, no amino acid in its... Um, in its original form or its native form has um, phosphorus unless it's um, specifically modified anyway so in this experiment um, what exactly happened so in here you have your um, this is what a bacteriophage looks like so uh, it actually looks, looks like an alien from uh, from the old Justice League cartoon actually so y- this is a fudge so you have a protein coat you have its uh, tail fiber, so it's protein, the, the outer structure is protein, and inside is, basically, you have your nucleic acid, or the DNA inside your protein coat. Now, so, in one set of uh, experiment, um, you have uh, a, a sulfur-labeled protein coat, so the sulfur, uh, you can detect the sulfur here, so it's in the capsid head, and then another set, we have your phosphorus-labeled, this is uh, the nucleic acid. So they label the nucleic acid and they label the proteins. So they allow the bacteriophages to infect your bacterial cells. And they found out that uh, the radio-labeled sulfur is found outside the cell, but the radio-labeled phosphorus, which is the DNA, is found inside the cell. So therefore, the, the transforming principle must be DNA and not protein because the protein here from the viruses do not enter the cell. It's actually the DNA that enters the cell. As shown in the experiment, they found the radio-labeled phosphorus inside the cell, bacterial cell that is, whereas the radio-labeled um, sulfur is found outside. So this, this is the conclusive, um, uh, this definitively um, tells us that it's actually, yes, it's the DNA that is the transforming principle. So we have now, they now have an idea what the DNA what is the DNA's function? What is the DNA for? So let's uh, recap. What is a nucleotide? A nucleotide is a nucleic acid monomer consisting of a 5-carbon sugar, which is your deoxyribose, and three phosphate groups, 
and one of the four nitrogen containing bases so that is the nucleotide is basically the um, building block of your nucleic acid and for the dna the deoxyribonucleic acid we have four nucleotide building blocks we have two pyrimidines this is the nitrogen bases uh, this is your thymine and cytosine and two purines the adenine and the guanine. So basically, this is the the, the the DNA structure. So this is a nucleotide, or rather, uh, the components of a nucleotide structure. You must have a nitrogen base, a sugar, a five carbon sugar, and uh, by the way, since it's called deoxyribose, so you have a deoxygenated um, part here. So you instead of an OH here, you have um, hydrogens. So no OH groups, no hydroxyl groups on the second position. So that's that's your deoxyribose. For an uh, for a ribonucleic acid, the RNA, you have a, a hydroxyl group in the second position. But anyway, this is DNA. So you do not have a, a hydroxyl group in the second position. And then you have the phosphate groups. Now, this is a nucleotide. So a nucleotide has three phosphate groups, but when you string them together to form the nucleic acids, they have um, the, the two two of the three phosphate groups will be removed. So anyway, these are the four bases. We have adenine, cytosine, guanine and thymine so what you call a pyrimidine and a purine base is, is by virtue of look at the nitrogen uh, structure of the nitrogen base so pyrimidine uh, rather purines have two uh, fused rings whereas the pyrimidine has a single hexagonal ring so basically that's that so you have thymine cytosine adenine and guanine so adenine and guanine are purines cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines so that doesn't conclude exactly uh, more uh, or rather about the DNA's role or rather the structure and the function of the DNA. So after the Hershey and Chase experiment, we have Erwin Shargaff. In 1950, he discovered important clues on the DNA structure because the DNA, uh, uh, since, uh, since the um, Hershey and Chase experiment, they know that oh, the DNA is a transforming principle. It's actually the hereditary material. And as a hereditary material, it must contain information. And how does it contain, how, does, how can it uh, contain, store, and transmit information then? Now, several of the clues was provided by Erwin Shargaff in 1950s. So, uh, he, he devised, from his experiments, he devised two rules. The first rule is that the amounts of thymine and adenine in the DNA are the same, and the amounts of cytosine and guanine are the same. So that's the first rule of Shargaff. This is uh, based on experimental his experimental studies, and uh, his, he uh, he determined that every single time he determined the amount of adenines, thymines, guanines, and cytosines in the DNA, adenine and thymines are always of the same concentration, guanines and cytosines are always of the same concentration. And then the second rule. The proportion of adenine and guanine differs between species and organisms. So, adenine and guanine can, uh, are, have different amount, but adenine and thymine must ha are always the same. Now, it just wasn't until um, Rosalind Franklin's uh, very controversial um, X-ray uh, crystallographic image of the DNA that the DNA structure was actually determined. Uh, by around this time, there was uh, a, a sort of a contest or a race among, um, among researchers, among biochemists, about the DNA structure because um, at that time, it's already an established fact that the DNA is the hereditary material of the cell. It contains a lot of information about the organism itself. And so it's a very important molecule. And the, the question now remains is that how does it contain, how does it store and transmit the information? And, the, and similar to the principle with proteins, it, uh, the, the secret must lie in its structure. So the, there, was, um, there was a race, a contest or a race among the scientists uh, on how to, uh, on finding out the structure of the DNA. Actually, one of the contenders by that time was Linus Pauli. He was... Uh, at that time, he was an acclaimed uh, biochemist. Uh, he was well known in the field because he was the one who discovered um, the triple helix structure of the collagen and won a Nobel Prize. Uh, I think several adult, he's, he won two Nobel Prizes at that time already. So he was one of those um, leading contenders at the race. Uh, however, uh, in in uh, in a certain laboratory in, uh, in England, so we have uh, Rosalind Franklin. Uh, Rosalind Franklin was a physicist. 
he she was not a biologist she was a physicist and he was doing x-ray crystallographic images of several biomolecules and he and one of his uh, work is that he purified as a DNA sample and um, he uh, he obtained results from that and obtained an x-ray crystallographic image however um, Actually, this is a more controversial story. But anyway, the 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 image that that image that Rosalind Franklin took, he was it was at that time still yet unpublished. But um, James Watson, an American um, graduate student, and Francis Crick, uh, that uh, James Watson's advisor at that time, um, they 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 were able to see the the unpublished photo of the DNA. X-ray crystallographic photo of the DNA by Rosalind Franklin. So, and from that image, they they deduced the double helix structure of the DNA. And up until now, the double helix structure is actually quite famous. Uh, when we have when we see a DNA, we already think about the double helical structure. So, from the X-ray crystallographic image, James Watson and Francis Crick managed to to uh, elucidate the structure of the DNA, and they were able to. Um, to actually um, explain how it can store information, how it transmit information, how can it pass information through several generations, and it uh, and their structure um, fits well with the Chergaff's rule, which is the adenine is equal to thymine, guanosine is equal to cytosine, guanine is equal to cytosine. So this is the model that um, that. Uh, Francis Crick, the one studying, and the one on the lower uh, left, which is James Watson, uh, that made about the DNA structure. So in the next video, let's um, we will be discussing more on uh, the structure of the DNA.